What's going on, everybody? Welcome back into the Frogs Up TC Sports podcast. We appreciate y'all joining us here on our midweek episode this Wednesday evening. I am Russ Hodges. That is Anthony North. We are back again to talk about all things TCU sports. And boy, we have a big slate for a midweek episode this evening. Some big women's basketball news that we're going to start out with. A couple wins to recap there as well for the women's team. The men's team picking up a win. And TCU football getting ready to take on the Baylor Bears this weekend. 2.30 kickoff, Amon G. Carter Stadium. The Blue Bonnet Battle, as they are calling it now. Uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about that when we talk about this game. But we have a, a big slate of content this evening. We're also going to briefly preview the Week 12 slate of Big 12 football games. So a lot to cover this evening. I am going to be hitting the road tomorrow, flying down to DFW. Just bought tickets for the men's game uh, Friday night against Mississippi Valley State. And uh, Saturday, going to be at the Baylor game. My pops and I are flying down, so we're really excited for that. And it's going to be a, a fun weekend in the DFW. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, everybody come out to Shaw Myers, see your celebrity here. Russ Hodges will be at the game. Get, find him at the Carter. Find him at Shaw Meyer. Uh Yeah. I no, will be signing it, autographs it, for anybody who's, <laughs> who's interested. Yeah, get your selfie with with Russ. That's that's all good. Yeah, I'll, I'll be out at some of that as well. I'm hoping to get out to the women's game on Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon against Army. I, I think that'll be a fun one. I won't be able to make it to the uh, the basketball game on Friday night, but I should be out at at the football game, and I'm hoping to make it out for the women's game as well. It's it's a uh, a big weekend of sports out here in Fort Worth for sure. This episode, of course, is brought to y'all by our friends at Charlie Hustle Clothing Company. Charlie Hustle, vintage made fresh. Go to charliehustle.com now. Get your TCU swag. Basketball season is in full swing. We still have some football. Get your TCU shirts, hoodies. Use the promo code Frogs O War. Frogs O War. Get 15% off all TCU items. Or you could use the promo code 101215. That's T E N 1215 through our partnership with the 1012 Network. That code gets you 15% off any items at charliehustle.com. They have a great assortment of collegiate apparel, professional sporting apparel, and more. So check that out, charliehustle.com. All right, we got to start with women's basketball this evening because we have some big news that broke earlier this week. And, and I was coming home from the gym. I saw this posted in our group chat, and I almost had to do a double take because it, it just came out of nowhere. Haley Cavender, one of the Cavender twins, extremely popular on social media. They have a massive following there. Great basketball players as well. Started their career at Fresno State, went to Miami, helped lead that team to the Elite Eight, entered the portal after last season. Haley talked about wanting to come back and play, and she has committed, actually not only committed, but signed with TCU for the 2024 season. This is a huge deal. We talked a lot about Mark Campbell and his staff bringing in some big time transfers from the West Coast for this season, most notably Sedona Prince from Oregon, Madison Connor from Arizona. But this is a huge addition to the program, not only for on the court reasons, but also for off the court reasons. This is a player who is a huge name. She and her sister, both Hannah Cavender is the other sister. They have a massive following on social media. I believe their their official Cavender Twins TikTok account has over four and a half million followers, over 300,000 followers on Instagram. The two of them individually have hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok and Instagram. Um, th this is really an unprecedented deal for the women's program, but Haley Cavender is coming to DFW. She will be a Horn Frog next year. She'll be, a, I believe, a graduate transfer with one year of eligibility, but I'm sure a lot of folks are going to want to come out to Schollmeyer and watch her play next year. And I wouldn't be surprised if Jeremiah Donati, athletic director at TCU, he and his staff and Haley and their team, they're probably cooking some things up as we speak to maybe do some, some meet and greets or autograph signings or something, because she's one of the biggest names in, in women's college basketball. And of all programs, you know, we saw Haley Van Lith transfer from, Louisville to LSU and LSU has, you know, all those players that are worth millions in NIL value, like Angel Reese and Flage Johnson, they bring Haley Van Lithen and you have UConn. That's a, a powerhouse 
in women's college basketball and Iowa's having a tremendous year again with Caitlin Clark, but it's TCU that lands Haley Cavender. And like, this is a, an unprecedented addition to this program. And it can't be stated enough how, how much of an impact Mark Campbell and his staff have made at TCU in such a quick time period. Yeah, this is, this is huge. I mean, this is a legit celebrity joining TCU campus, TCU women's basketball program. I mean, this is, you said one of the most famous women's basketball players. This is one of the most famous college athletes, period. Mm. I mean, maybe just one of the most famous people uh, in, in the sports world. This is um, people who don't follow women's college basketball or college athletics at all know who the Cavender twins are and are following them on social media. And yeah, for, for Mark Campbell to come in and have built this atmosphere uh, where she feels like this is the, the right place for her to come back. I mean, obviously um, all of the things she's doing in the NIL space and taking the year off and, and coming back, the uh, TCU has has obviously laid the groundwork here. And, you know, a lot of it is probably his connections from his days at Oregon and all the players out there bringing in Sedona Prince and being able to show that who is right up there with, you know, all of those other co women's college basketball players in social media following and and kind of notoriety um, to show how that's been handled. And I'm sure that, Prince has been able to to describe what it's like to to come into this program and onto this campus. So, I, just a, an absolutely huge deal for TCU. And yeah, I mean the the TCU social media team and the marketing team and everybody has to be uh, really stepping their game up because there's there's going to be big opportunity to sell the university to sell the athletic department um, through this. So uh, there'll be a lot of eyes on. TC women's college basketball when Haley Cavender joins next season, but there should be a lot of uh, eyes on women's college basketball already this season. They're having a terrific season. So it, it looks like there's just going to be great things to come going forward for that program. Yeah. And TCU is getting a legitimate big time talent on the court as well. And I think people are going to immediately look at what the Cavenders are doing off the court, but Haley Cavender averaged, 12 points and five rebounds last year was a starter for Miami. Again, helped lead that team to the elite eight and has started over a hundred games in her career was uh, one of the best freshmen in the country when she started her career at Fresno state. So really exciting for the future of this program. And in the present, we have a couple wins to talk about here this evening as we were recording Sunday, a little bit beforehand, the women's team had wrapped up a decisive win over Rice. This was another non-conference game at Schulmeyer Arena. Madison Connor, Sedona Prince continued to roll. They've been dominant over these first three games. The two of them combined for 37 points and 25 rebounds in this game as TC won over the Owls 67 to 42. Madison Connor was also named the Big 12 Women's Basketball Player of the Week. So congratulations to her. Absolutely deserving. She's been on a tear these last few games. She had 19 points and 11 rebounds in the win over Rice on Sunday. Sedona Prince also with 18 points and 14 rebounds. Third consecutive double-double for her. TCU shot nearly 50% from three-point range and really crushed the Owls in the second quarter. Outscored them 25-9 to nine in that quarter to wrap up the win on Sunday and then coming back earlier today, it was a, a pretty early tip off. I want to say it was maybe 11 a.m. or a noon tip off yeah, a matinee. Yeah. New sure. Central. Yeah. Yeah. Matinee for sure against Incarnate Word. Again, another non conference game, but this one was actually pretty competitive in the early going. Incarnate Word actually had the lead early in the game. TC was able to turn things around in the second quarter. Sedona Prince had a huge game. She scored 26 points, which is a season high for her. Madison Connor added 17 points. Again, that's the, the, the dynamic duo in the early going here for, for TCU. And 
Uh, the Frogs, I think, gave up 11 or 12 consecutive points toward the end of the game, but were able to hang on for a win, 61 to 55, the final score. So TCU, 4 and 0 to start the season. They will play Army on Sunday and will be the Maggie Dixon Classic. And just a, a tremendous start for TCU women's basketball. We've talked about it in recent episodes. The, the players that have been brought in, all five starters are transfers. They're all new players. So they've been able to find their roles quickly. They've been able to gel. And it's led to a lot of early success. Yeah, this uh, this game this afternoon what is pretty cool. It's the uh, the field trip game where local schools, um, you know, they get the day out to to come in elementary schools and middle schools here locally around Fort Worth, uh, go to Shulmire Arena and get to take in some TCU basketball. So it makes for a fun atmosphere in the arena. But um, yeah, really kind of a, a tough start to this game. TCU trail by six after the first quarter and pretty much dominated the second quarter, hit a three right at the halftime buzzer to yep. to take a lead into halftime. Um, but things were things were just kind of not working. And, you know, I guess it's it's kind of a, a little bit of a slump that they can get into if if some of those shots aren't falling, but they uh they absolutely did fall in the second half. I mean, yeah, Madison Connor ends up hitting four three pointers and that kind of powers the day uh and and Sedona Prince defensively offensively um distributing she she really does it all is is a very impressive basketball player so um a player like that ends up you have that kind of skill talent on the court that uh you're able to escape with this win I think this is a game that TCU teams of old might have lost that TCU very well could have lost this game, but just uh, willed their way back out of it and and really it turned in a an impressive defensive performance. I mean, holding um, under like thirty percent, I think it was like thirty two percent shooting for the game for Incarnate Word. So um, impressive defensively, and I, you know I, I I do worry a little bit that as you get into some of the more difficult competition, you're not going to be able to have those, you know, six minute lapses, those near full quarter worth of uh, poor play and recover from it. So good to go get this win, but it, it clearly shows some cracks that coach Campbell can kind of go and address going forward as the competition picks up uh, here later on. But to get this win, to move to four and zero on the season for the first time in, in, quite a while um it's an impressive start and and lays the groundwork to what should be a uh, very strong season and you bring up the defense this comes after tcu held rice to uh, two of 14 shooting from three-point range and 25 percent shooting in that game so tcu right now getting it done on both ends of the floor and the men's team is also getting it done on both ends of the floor as tcu Basketball collectively is unbeaten this year. Seven combined wins for the two TCU basketball programs. The men's team had a game uh, last night against UT Rio Grande Valley. It's another non-conference game and a bit of a sluggish start for TCU in this one. There were a lot of turnovers in the first half. I believe there were 12 total turnovers for TCU in the first half, but uh, some good offensive performances from players like Jacoby Coles and Avery Anderson, who had 15 points off the bench. Jameer Nelson had a really strong game, finished with 15 points, and Jacoby Coles ultimately led the way with 16 as I think nine or 10 different TCU players scored at least one point in this game. TCU ultimately wins 88 to 55, the final score. TCU offensively, again, it's the, the early going of non-conference play, against some very mediocre programs, but TCU averaging almost 93 points per game over these first three games. And you compare this to last season where TCU really struggled in some of these non-conference games. I mean, it took a a big time performance from Mike Miles Jr. last year just to beat Lamar. You had the game against Arkansas Pine Bluff where you really struggled. So uh, TCU coming out 
to start non-conference play this season and really blowing teams away. I mean, you score 108 points, 108 points against Southern, 82 to 60 win over Nebraska Omaha, and now a 33 point win over UT Rio Grande Valley. It's nice to see a lot of these new players. It's a similar situation to the women's team. A lot of new players, quite a few new starters that are having to adjust and find their roles. And offensively, it's been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, The free throw shooting has been okay, I think, to start the year, but TCU has moved the ball pretty well. And the, the scoring, they're getting it from a lot of different players. You know, it's not just two or three guys going off and nobody else is really doing anything. It's six, seven, eight different guys that are hitting multiple field goals and getting it done on the offensive end. So a, a, a good performance overall for, for TCU. Starting off 3-0, and next game is going to be Friday night against Mississippi Valley State. Again, I just purchased some tickets a little while ago, so excited to get out to Schollmeyer with my dad. It'll be my first men's basketball game in a while. Um, but, again, a good start for TCU getting this win on Tuesday. Yeah, the the turnover issue in the, in the first half was really concerning. It kept things really slow. The scoring, I mean, this was another game TCU probably could have scored 110 points um, if it had been a little cleaner with its possessions in the first half. But you come out of this, uh, we've we've often been concerned with TCU's free throw shooting. This one, they are 10 of 11 from the free throw line. So shooting over 90% on free throws and getting back to that uh, fast pace, fast tempo, get your fast break points, outscored uh, UTRGV 25 to 6 on the fast break. So that's that's good to see that um, continuing. That was... TCU was one of the best in the country at that last year. They're already one of the highest tempo, highest scoring teams in the country this season. So continuing that effort is impressive. And then making it happen from the three-point line. Here in this game, Emmanuel Miller hit a career-high three three-pointers. Um, he and Coach Dixon both talked quite a bit in the off season, leading up to the season on – that was – something that uh, a point of emphasis that they were trying to implement into his game to one to show for the next level that, you know, that Miller is able to hit those shots, but that it's, it's something that he's really worked on to improve and to help this team. And, and it came through in this one, he was three of four. So um, yeah, I, again, like you say, these are, not the elite talents. These are all, you know, in the net quad four wins for TCU, but they are wins and the team is really looking good um, and, and should be able to continue on Friday as well. And a couple notes that I'll make here as well, just general observations before we get into the football stuff is, it's been really exciting to see Jacoby Coles build off of what he did last season. We saw him really emerge toward the end of last year, especially in the NCAA tournament where he hits the huge shot against Arizona state. He's a starter now and he's just, he just, he just has a great all around game. And I think we talked about that last year as well as he's, you know, we've seen the comments that he's just a hooper. You know, he seems to be doing a lot of the right things at the right times, just a good fundamentally sound player doesn't make a lot of mistakes he takes good quality shots and he, he's going to be a big piece of this team this year so that's been exciting to to watch and then the, the depth has been huge I mean when you get 15 points off the bench from Avery Anderson you have Trey Tennyson who's arguably the best shooter on your team coming off the bench Esam Mustafa's had a couple of really nice games as well I think there's still a little bit of a competition uh, going on for those front court spots Ernest Duda has kind of struggled you know, offensively, I think he might have one or two points all season, but he's been rebounding the ball at a pretty high rate, and he's been blocking some shots. So that's been impressive to see, and uh, we'll hope to just see a little bit more offensive growth and development there. But you know, just a couple general observations there from from me over this early going of the season here as we will go ahead and transition into our next big item on the podcast this evening, 
We have a football game coming up Saturday, the Blue Bonnet Battle, as it is being called, as TCU is going to get ready to face the Baylor Bears. 2.30 kickoff, again, Eamon G. Carter Stadium. It's going to be a packed house. Two teams that have really struggled this year. It's kind of similar to the Texas Tech game where we have a couple teams that just have not really performed up to expectations. And I have to start, though, with the Blue Bonnet Battle because this is going on. Uh, it's going viral on social media, especially the, the TCU burner accounts are getting very active about this. So if you haven't checked it out at, at the press conference a few days ago, with Sonny Dyke spoke to the media, they showed off the new helmets that they're going to wear this weekend, which by the way, are awesome. If y'all nope. haven't checked out the content on Twitter, please do yourself a favor. If there are any shirts or hoodies available at the bookstore, go check them out. They're there may not be any at this point, but they're they're going with the the anthracite red purple uniforms, the uh, the throwback frog emblem on the helmet. They look awesome. The chrome red face masks, and then you have the trophy for the blue bonnet battle, which is the the rivalry that's going to be maintained in the conference schedule as the Big Twelve gets ready to move to the sixteen team format, and. The trophy, which they also showed off during the press conference, the thing is absolutely massive. It, it doesn't look really like a trophy at all. Um, I think there was a comment Griffin Kell made that, oh, it, it kind of looks cool, I guess. You know, it's it, it looks like it looks more like a like a headstone, to be honest. It, yeah. lo- like, it, it looks like, like it's something... uh, at a gravesite. It's rough. It looks like something that someone would have as a home decoration or like uh, something you would put in your garden. Maybe something that a, a, a high school student works on in their woodshop class. I'm, I'm not trying to be overly disrespectful. I'm sure whoever <laughs> built that put time and effort into it. But the, the whole idea of the blue bonnet battle, like I, I don't get the context of it. I mean, maybe you do, Anthony, because you're a Texas. You're uh, you've been in Texas for yeah, a while. I mean, blue bonnets. Blue bonnets are flowers that like grow on the side of the highway, and I guess like maybe they grow on the side of the highway on I-35 between Fort Worth and Waco. Uh, and you know, I mean, blue bonnet is it's a very Texas flower. It's it's a it's a Texan thing, but yeah, I mean, it's I, I don't know that it really has any special meaning to. TCU and Baylor, you know, and it just it's it, it it rubs me the wrong way a little bit, I guess, because it just feels like a a manufactured way oh, of making this rivalry more than what it is right now. I mean, don't get me wrong, TCU Baylor is certainly a rivalry. Is it where it could be right now? Probably not, because the two teams are not very good this year. But I, I don't know. I feel like you you can't really just create a trophy out of thin air and brand something as a rivalry because you want to, you know? Well, it, yeah, I, I agree. I think if, if you're going to do the, look, this is already a rivalry. It already has like a, in a, a well accepted name for the rivalry that all of like college football lexicon knows, and that's the revivalry. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like that, don't use it. Um, you know, but just creating this out of nothing, it, it it's kind of meaningless. And if you're going to create a rivalry trophy or a rivalry, it needs to be fun. Like there needs to be something interesting. There's just, I don't know. There's no juice to this. You know, I think seeing that this was, uh, is actually a shield. I wish it had, the, the trophy had just been the shield and not like the wooden frame or whatever that's around the shield. And like, I, I don't, I don't know. They're, they're just, it, it's okay to have something that you're passing back and forth. Like the saddle is, is super cool between uh, Texas Tech and TCU. I think that's pretty neat. The iron skill. I mean, frankly, all of these rivalry games are kind of cringe and lame and, and silly <laughs> anyway. They, they don't, you know, whatever Paul Bunyan's ax or the, the little Brown jug or, the egg bowl or whatever, all of these things, they, you know, they're, they're just fun and silly. Uh, do something fun and silly. If it was just a shield and it was like, you know, 
call it whatever, call it the Texas, Shield, even call it the blue bonnet shield. And you just, you, I don't know the, the way it's been pitched as like this camaraderie between Baylor and TCU. And we all love and respect each other, which is just false. We don't love and respect each Untrue, other. Yeah. I, I do not love and respect Baylor and Baylor doesn't love and respect us. Like that's just the way it is. And, and to pretend otherwise is, uh, is absurd. Um, you know, in the context of a, a particularly in the context of a football game. Um, yeah, this trophy represents the respect between no, no, it doesn't. No, there's, <laughs> there's nothing about TCU and Baylor that represents uh mutual respect. So, um, and, yeah, and there's no yeah. real, there's no real sentimental value with this trophy either. Even the name, like the, the iron skillet, there's clearly, a sentiment there that resonates with people in both fan bases. And the same can be said for the saddle and for some of the other rivalry trophies that exist. But I just have a hard time coming to terms with crafting a trophy out of nowhere and then slapping a name on it and saying, this is the rivalry now. Yeah. It, no. it feels very much like the civil conflict trophy between UCF and Connecticut that they tried to manufacture in the American athletic conference. I don't know if you remember that, but it, I guess it was a play on words about con for Connecticut and full for Florida. And so it was the civil conflict and it, it was uh, this terrible trophy and no one respected it. And the trophy just disappeared. And apparently it's been recently found, but the, the teams left it on the field. They didn't even celebrate with the trophy. It was a, it was a complete farce and everyone just kind of made fun of it and moved on. Um, it feels like that, like somebody somewhere thought, let's, let's get our hands in this. And, and they have, and, and I think it, it'll be fine. I mean, you know what, call it whatever you want to call it. You can continue calling this the revivalry. You can call it whatever the, all of the fun names that everybody's been coming up with on, on Twitter. That's, that's all been good. Call it what you want to call it. I mean, the Farmageddon game, there's no like formal branding to Farmageddon. You know, you can call the Iowa State Iowa game El Asico if you want to. No one's going to formally make an El Asico trophy that is, you know, announced by the Iowa State and Iowa student governments. Um, you know, so continue to have fun with it. Continue to disrespect and, and have as much sports hate for each other as you want. Um, and if, you know, hopefully that trophy just stays together and like if somebody's li when Sonny Dykes lifts it over his head on Saturday that it doesn't like come crashing down because it looks gigantic and heavy and like it would hurt a lot if it were to fall on yeah the trophy I think they showed the backside of the trophy there were a couple pictures that were shown on social media the thing literally has uh leather straps on the backside of it because it is that big so you're gonna be you're gonna have to hold this thing <laughs> Like it's like it's a big backpack over your head and you know, blue, blue bonnet or no blue bonnet. There is going to be a game played this weekend and it's going to be rowdy. TCU still has something to play for despite being four and six. TCU can still get to a bowl game if it they wins. still have a blue bonnet trophy to win. Come on. And, a, and, and a, yeah, the blue bonnet trophy. No, I, I, I did not see. I'm assuming the trophy is going to be a part of the festivities this weekend. I didn't know if this was a, you know, we're going to wait until we get into the, the new big 12 or not. No, but. I think it's, I mean, it's there. It's all, the winner of the game this week takes the trophy and it will be proudly held at the front of campus. I don't know, but yes, yes. I think it, it is supposed it, it can, to be handed it, out at the, at the end of this game. If, if TCU wins the game, they can put it in the display case inside Schulmeyer and, and go, go ahead and just leave it there for the, the next 12 months. Yeah. <laughs> but, this this game, you know, Baylor, really Baylor isn't playing for anything, I think. I mean, Baylor's three and seven, not eligible for a bowl game unless by some miracle they get an invite at five and seven, which I don't know if that's a scenario, but you know, Dave Aranda, his clock may or may not be running out in Waco. It's been a, a really bad season for the Bears. You lose to Houston in overtime. You get blown out by Kansas State. And just like that, your bull hopes vanished. And 
Now Baylor on the road facing a TCU team that can still get to six and six, can still get to a bowl game. Now you do have to beat Oklahoma on the road in the last week of the regular season, but I think TCU has to win this game by, I mean, of course they have to win this game, but I think if, if TCU were to lose this game, there is going to be some very, very unhappy folks within the frog fan base. Um, Baylor is just struggling big time right now. The defense, Dave Aranda specialty, he's a defensive coach. After coming over from LSU, that's where he made his name. The defense for the Bears has just not been there this year. They've given up a lot of points. They don't really have any big-time skill players on the offensive side. I know they brought Dominic Richardson over from Oklahoma State, the running back. Richard Reese has had a couple of big games in, in years past, but – They've had inconsistent play at the quarterback position. They started the year with Sawyer Robertson, the Mississippi State transfer. He ultimately got benched for Blake Shapin, who was the starter uh, last year, and the quarterback who had taken over for Charlie Brewer, who transferred out. There's been a lot of turnover at that position, and the defense has not been very good. So if you're TCU, you'd really like to come out and – blow the bears out of the water in a similar fashion that you did BYU. Um, TCU has been much better at home this year than they've been on the road. And if you want to get to a bowl game, you're going to have to start here and win this game. So I'm, I'm really optimistic that TCU will come out and play at a high level in this one. But at the same time, you had Texas at home last weekend, you did everything you could in the fourth quarter to come back and put yourself in a position to win against a top 10 opponent. And you just came up a little bit short and you wonder, is that the game that, you know, everyone tried really hard to win and you lost and now uh, we don't really have much to play for over these last couple of weeks. I hope that's not the case, but you know, I think there was a comment that Savion Williams made after the Texas game where he said, half of us expected to win and half of us expected to lose. Um, that's a, a tough quote after a game like that, but I'm, I'm really hoping that TCU comes out and plays with the same energy and the same intensity that they played with during that Texas game. Because I think if they do that, they should win this game relatively easily. For sure. I mean, we've talked all season about <clears> – <throat> the excitement to go play football, the motivation factor. And this is a big time. Where's the motivation factor game? Because yeah, you, you're coming off the emotional game against Texas. You can take the final result of that one way or another. You can either say we lost and our season's over and we're packing it in and we'll see you next fall. Or you can say, look, we just, hung in there and had a chance at the end with a top 10 team. Let's go this next game and, and crush these guys. Um, yeah, I would certainly hope that they, they come out motivated and, and ready to go win this game. Um, but to be determined, I think you said TCU has to win this game. And I, if TCU were to lose this game, game it's hard to recall a loss that would be worse mm -hmm. um recently i mean we're we're looking back at like uh 2019 west virginia where you lose and you play with no energy and you you miss a bowl because of it you're thinking of ah like 2011 smu um like this is as bad a team as TCU has played and could lose to um, at least the way that Baylor has played this season. Now, do I think Baylor could also similarly get up for this game and, and put on their look, our season is shot. We're not going to a bowl. So here's our bowl game right here. This is it. Um, now last season they played in an actual bowl game in Amon G Carter stadium and they got wiped off the field. Uh, I think it was Air Force. Yeah. So, mm, you know, maybe maybe they don't much really care to play in in Fort Worth either. But 
I, I think that motivation factor will be very interesting because on paper, TCU should should roll with some relative ease in this one. I mean, Baylor statistically bottom one or two in the conference in just about every category. Um, and, and yeah, the Dave Aranda defense has been terrible. Um, bottom of the conference in in scoring, bottom in rushing defense. Uh, you know, they're kind of okay to average in passing defense, but, um, you know, this is a game. And just to say how I think this game should go, this game, Amani Bailey should have 25 touches. Um, you know, we, uh, again, I know that's probably not what this offensive coordinator wants to do because, you know, I, I don't know, maybe we don't care to win football games, but Amani Bailey is the guy. And this is the worst rush defense in the league. So go and, and run over them. Um, I think that Amani Bailey should have a monster game if he's given the opportunity to, and TCU should, should run away with it. And I guess we'll, we'll just see on Saturday how it shakes out. And I'm glad you brought up Amani Bailey because it's a good segue into my next question. As we get to, the end of this 2023 season. And we started to talk about this after the Texas game. We talked about, you know, who's going to be on this TCU team in 2024. Who are some players that we can be excited about? Who are some players that can show us some things to give us optimism for the future? Starting with this Baylor game, there are a couple individuals that I really want to see step up and have a good performance against a mediocre opponent. Josh Hoover is obviously one of them. I think he's your starting quarterback for the rest of the season. I think he's shown a lot of promise this year. He's done a lot of really nice things. He's made some freshman mistakes, but he's if he can have a really good game against Baylor and then a decent showing or better against Oklahoma, I think he's probably your starting quarterback in 2024 unless you were to go out and secure a big time transfer, which I don't, I don't know if that would be the yeah, case. 2024 or, TCU quarterback, Arch Manning or, or 2024 quarterback Malik Murphy. If yeah. uh, you know, one of those guys is going to be out of there for sure. There's no way with, with reports that yours is going to be back for 2024. Uh, you know, Arch Manning has said all the right things. I you know, maybe, but one of those three guys, is is certainly not going to be there. One one guy I hope is still around though for TCU is Josh Hoover. I I like what I've seen from him personally, and I think the the turnovers that he's made those are things you can coach and you can you can learn from those. And I, I want to see him have a good game like he did against BYU. So he's one of them. Another one is Cam Cook, and Cam Cook is a a four star player, a freshman who is not redshirting because he's played in more than four games. However, even though he's only played in, he's played in seven games, but he only has 10 or 11 touches. That just doesn't really compute with me. I don't know why you would burn a red shirt of a really talented player like that and not get him involved. But Anthony, you mentioned Baylor's run defense and how they're arguably the worst team in the conference against the run. So if you're going to, showcase one of your young players this is probably the game to do it if you can run the ball effectively with Amani Bailey I think it's kind of obvious the coaching staff doesn't really view Trey Sanders in high regard because he didn't even get a touch last week give give Cam Cook some touches and see what he can do and, and see if he's going to be a guy that can make a bigger impact for your football team in 2024 that's another guy I want to watch out for and then Lastly, on the defensive side, Paul Oyewale has been extremely quiet over the last several games. He's a player that had a really good game against Colorado. He had a, a good game against Nickel State and against SMU, but I don't think he has a sack over his last five or six games. It might have even been longer than that. I think he's a guy that has the size and the ability to be one of your next really good edge linemen. But 
we haven't seen it over the last several weeks. And I, I'd like to see him come out and have a big game on, on Saturday because I mean, how many times have we talked on the podcast about the lack of pass rush that this TC defensive line has put forward? Sonny Dykes uh, in the press conference earlier this week talked about the, the fact that he still believes in the three, three, five. He still believes that it's a scheme that can be run effectively. I agree with him there. He also commented on the fact that when he came in, he knew that the defensive line was going to have to be rebuilt. I also agree with him there, but I think there are a couple guys that have sort of regressed from last year. I mean, Tymon Mitchell had three and a half sacks last season. I don't think he has a sack this year. Um, Rick DeBreu, you brought him over from East Carolina. He might have maybe one sack this year. And Paul Iwale, who's a, a redshirt freshman, is a player that had a really strong start to the season and is just kind of faded away. So those are guys between Cam Cook, Josh Hoover, and Paul Iwale. Those are three guys that I want to see step up and have a really good game on Saturday. Who are the guys that you're going to be watching out for, Anthony? Yeah, man, I 100% agree with you on Paul, Paul Oyewale. That is on my roundtable answers. That's going to be my guy defensively that I'm really looking for a big game. Baylor is last in the conference at sacks allowed, giving up uh, the <laughs> the most sacks by a very large margin. Um, and TCU just has to get to the quarterback in this one. Um, it is going to be... I, I if they if the defense gets embarrassed in this game, it's over. I mean the 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 Gillespie era is over. The three three five probably doesn't come back in any form in the next coaching regime. So uh, I, I think that TCU will have to get after the quarterback here, and they should be able to find success doing that. And they should be able to find success rushing three down linemen. Um, and I think where that comes is Oyewale dominates the day. Um, so I, I have very high expectations for him in this game and in his future as a Horn Frog. So um, looking forward to what he hopefully can do against this Baylor offensive line, um, <laughs> just attacking the quarterback. Offensively, you know, I think I probably before last week, I would have said Savion Williams that I've just been like waiting for that breakout, but he already had that breakout. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, ah, I don't, I don't know if I have like a, a number one guy. There's probably, if I'm looking at freshmen, I'm probably thinking of, uh, Jordan Bailey, Amani's brother. He's shown some flashes of some dynamic playmaking, uh, his speed, I think he, you know, if we're looking at guys who it's like, hey, I, I want to see what you've got here. Um, I kind of want to see if he's in line to be that uh, kind of Darius Davis, Tay Barber type guy in the offense. Um, yeah, I th I, that's and it's uh, like you said, Josh Hoover um, should absolutely have a game like the the BYU game here. I think this is. Uh, would would love to see him put up some some big time stats, distribute the ball. Um, we will unfortunately continue to be without Dalen Wright and uh, Warren Thompson out for the season. So uh, the receiving core as a whole should all kind of have opportunities in this one, whether it's J.P. Richardson or uh, Jalen Robinson or JoJo Earl. JoJo Earl, where are you? Let's see something. Um, you know, I don't know what his eligibility is left after this. I'm sh I think he has to have at least one more year. Yeah, I um, believe he's a junior. So if he's coming back to TCU next year, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe what I said about Jordan Bailey, say that also about Jojo Earl in that I, I want to see you get involved in this offense and not just like gimmicky stuff on end arounds, like be a receiver. Um, that 
I, I think he, we had a, a, a person we had very high expectations for coming into the season, obviously a huge recruiting pedigree coming out of Alabama uh, as a transfer. And he, it really hasn't shown up on the field. So I, let's, let's see something with Jojo Earl here against Baylor. As we get into our predictions here, I'm going pretty lopsided for what feels like the first time in a while. I've been very conservative with some of my predictions over the last few weeks, and that's a product of how the season has gone for TCU. But I'm going to let it rip here a little bit. TCU, I have winning this game 41-17. to 17. I believe the spread is 14 points. It might have changed a little bit, but I just I can't see TCU – losing this game. I, I, I just can't. I, I know it's been a tough year, but this is not a good Baylor team. It's just not. And you're playing at home. It's also your senior day. You got to send the seniors off with a win. And I, I really think TCU is going to come out in this game and continue to play with that same energy that they had in the second half against Texas. And you know, Sonny Dykes also mentioned after that game that the team was already really excited for the Baylor game. and I guess we'll see if they can put their money where their mouth is, but I think they will. And I have TC rolling to a big win in this game on Saturday. I as well have TC winning this in relatively easy fashion, uh, not quite covering the two touchdown spread. I feel like that's uh, TCU shouldn't be favored by two touchdowns against anybody. Um, the way they've played this season. So yeah, they're, they're coming off a nice game against Texas, but we've, we've seen enough from this TCU team to think two touchdowns feels like quite a lot. So I have TCU winning 31 to 20. Um, I, I don't see how this Baylor offense can score anywhere near enough points to beat TCU. Um, I, and I'm knocking on wood a little bit there. That's my prediction. I think, you know, we've seen TCU, plenty of times the defense breaks down and and has gotten itself kind of embarrassed uh starting from from week one but nothing we've seen from Baylor even in the games where Baylor has been pretty good they haven't been able to score um you know they I thought they were going to beat Utah probably could have should have beaten Utah in the uh I think week two Mm -hmm. earlier this year in Waco had every opportunity to win that game, but the offense was just terrible. Um, they could not score enough points. Um, and and I think it's going to be a similar case here where maybe they hang around in the game because TCU just can't get out of its own way uh, as it has all season and continues to trip over its own feet and uh, you know turn the ball over or have bad penalties or bad turnovers. But... I still think, despite all of that, TCU has enough ways to score on this very leaky uh, Baylor defense, and Baylor just doesn't have enough ways to score. Um, I don't know that it has any ways to score. Um, So I, I think that the TCU defense gets after the quarterback, and that the secondary has kind of a bounce back game after. Um, you know, getting torched a little bit by Xavier Worthy and Donnie Mitchell last week. Not a little bit, a lot. They got torched. <laughs> um, and so I think they, I think everybody gets a little bit of a, all right, we, we are still pretty good at football and it's a nice boost headed into, uh, Thanksgiving week and the Black Friday matchup against Oklahoma. And we will ultimately see what happens. TCU in Baylor Saturday again, 2.30 kickoff, Amon G. Carter Stadium. Get out there, support the Frogs, get your anthracite black and red shirts, hoodies, jerseys, whatever it may be. Get out there to support the Frogs. If you're not in the area, go on ESPN Plus, the, the dreaded ESPN Plus slot. But support the Frogs. We have a full slate of Big 12 games coming up this weekend as well. Week 12, we are getting toward the end of the regular season. And I think we have a pretty quiet slate of games in the conference this weekend. We have Oklahoma traveling to BYU, 11 a.m. kickoff on ESPN. Cincinnati 
heading to Morgantown to take on West Virginia, 1.30 p.m. on ESPN+. Plus. Oklahoma State looking to bounce back after getting absolutely shredded by UCF. They will go to Houston for a 3 p.m. game on ESPN2. UCF at Texas Tech, 4 p.m., Fox Sports 2. The two big games are going to be the night games. Kansas State at Kansas, the in-state rivalry. Both of those teams still in the mix for a spot in the Big 12 title game. That'll be a 6 p.m. kickoff on FS1. And then Texas at Iowa State. I think this game has some serious upset potential based off what I saw in the Texas TCU game. Iowa State has a chance here to pull off an upset, in my opinion. I couldn't go far enough to pick Iowa State in our pick em, but I would not be surprised at all if the Cyclones find a way to win this game. 7 p.m. kickoff on Fox. Um, Texas right now is in the driver's seat in the conference. The only team with one loss in the conference, and then you have five teams, four or five teams, I believe, tied with two losses in conference play. So we'll have some more clarity after this weekend, or maybe not, because I think there was a scenario that somebody put out on Twitter. It's possible that there could be a eight-way tie for <laughs> first place in the Big 12. That's how crazy it is with these 14 teams and the, the I way think the Texas would have to lose twice. Year. I think, yeah, Texas would have to lose to, yeah, to Texas so Tech and to Iowa State. So I, I don't know how likely that is, but yes, it is possible. I don't have any strong thoughts really about some of these other games. Um, you know, Oklahoma, I think, goes to BYU and probably rolls in that game. West Virginia, I think, will take that one over Cincinnati as well. Maybe Oklahoma State stumbles again after getting blown out by UCF, but you know, Houston's a Houston's a pretty bad team. And uh you know, UCF, Texas Tech, that's kind of a kind of a stinker there. Uh, surprised that wasn't on streaming as well, but it's FS2, so that's basically streaming. Um Kansas State, Kansas, that'll be an exciting one to watch. Some some quarterback injuries have God, man, for the for the second year in a row, the quarterback injuries have just really hurt Kansas big time. I mean, last year, if if Jalen Daniels had stayed healthy, Kansas could have had a much better season. I think the same can be said this year. And I've got Jason Bean banged up. So who knows if Kansas will be able to hang in against the Wildcats. I think I think Kansas State will win that game. Yeah, man, I couldn't believe they put Jason Bean back in that game after the, the hit he took where he he was pretty well out and didn't know what planet he was on stumbling around. He comes back in the game, takes another pretty nasty hit. I, I, I think he probably should not play in that game uh, mm -hmm. just for his own safety. But um, yeah, you said you wouldn't be surprised if Iowa state beats Texas. I would be surprised if Iowa state beats Texas. Yeah. I, th I think Texas is, is um, going to roll into Arlington at this point and they're going to win this game. Um, you know, I, yeah, I guess we can all hold out hope. It's the same kind of, I mean, like Iowa state did that thing against man. W what year was that, that they took down Oklahoma state? Was that the crazy 2007 year? I don't know, but they, I Oklahoma remember. state was almost guaranteed to be in the national championship game and, and Iowa state beats him up there. Um, and so, yeah, crazy things happen in Ames, but, ah, I don't know. This feels like it's unfortunately the the thing that's destined to happen. And, and I guess it's a weird thing nationally this season. There's just been no real chaos at the top. Um, you know, everyone likes to point back to that crazy 2007 year of, Oh, that's this year is just like that. There's all these, there's so much parody. Anybody could win except that nobody can beat these top teams. Uh, you know, Georgia is not losing to anyone. Uh, Alabama is not losing to anyone, but Texas, Texas is not losing to anyone, but Oklahoma. Um, you know, the George is going to continue to roll Florida state, Washington, uh, these teams, basically the top 15 or so have remained about the top 15 all year. Uh, we'll see what happens in the last couple of weeks. There's opportunity for shakeup. And, uh, but I mean, for a lot of these teams, it's, it would have to be like massive, massive upsets. I mean, if if anybody beats Georgia, if 
Auburn ends up beating Alabama, if those those would be just gigantic upsets. Any of either of these games for Texas down the stretch, if they were to lose, it would be a, a, a pretty much a shocker in, in my opinion. So I think we're we're not getting the chaos, and maybe that just means when it hits, it's going to be uh, you know atomic bomb here, and the chaos just goes mm-hmm. crazy. But in the Big Twelve, I do I know. Like we don't have to worry about it as following TCU, but the the whole kind of controversy about the tiebreaker and how things are being clarified, or you know, there's certain fan bases who are like the the Big Twelve is changing the rules and we're moving the goalposts and all of that about the way that the Big Twelve tiebreaker is going to shake out. I think some of that will probably take care of itself. Um, but I mean, the thing is, if if there is a tie where the three teams tied are Oklahoma State, uh, Kansas State, and Oklahoma, that is very clearly should be Oklahoma State. They beat both of those teams, mm-hmm. right? So what whatever the rule needs to be to be clarified in that way, I think that's uh, I, that's that's the way it shakes out. And so, you know, Kansas State fans can go back to whining on the internet some more about whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I th- I think a lot of it will, will take care of itself and probably, frankly, it, it's probably going to be fine for Kansas State. I think it's going to be Kansas State, Texas in this in this championship and uh, should make for a pretty intriguing game in Arlington if that's the way it shakes out. And either way, it's going to be exciting down the stretch here for for the Big 12. Yeah, it's going to be a fun weekend of games to watch again. There's going to be games going on all day from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. So. If you're not watching the Frogs, tune into the Big 12. We'll see if any shockers come out on Saturday, and we will recap the Week 12 results when we do our weekend episode this coming Sunday, where we'll also recap the Baylor football game, as well as TCU men's basketball and TCU women's basketball. As we get ready to sign off here this evening, we appreciate all of you listening in to the Frogs Up TCU Sports Podcast. I am Russ Hodges. That is Anthony North. We appreciate all of the support and continue to follow us not only here on Frogs Up, but also online at Frogs Award, www.frogsaward.com, and on Facebook and Twitter at Frogs Award. Appreciate all the readers, all the commenters, all the support that we receive on our website and on our social media as well. So with that, we will conclude our midweek episode this week with a Frogs Up. Get your Frogs Up. Let's bring home those blue bonnets. (laughs) The blue bonnet.